It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcasted interviewing my mentor, my idol, Laz Petruska DDS. I, I always say on Dentaltown, he's the Socrates, Plato, Aristotle of uh, Dentaltown. Uh, <laughs> he's a self-employed independent contractor in Southern California. He does so many things. He's got profitable GPs. I love my dentist. I love my ortho club. Uh, but what I wanted to bring him on today was talking about his 3,000 posts on Dentaltown, which um, leave everybody hanging. Let me read his bio. Dr. Petruska grew up in Hungary and after graduating, uh, immigrated to the U.S. in 1988. After passing his dental boards, he started practicing as an associate in Santa Barbara, California. During his employment, he introduced implant dentistry, orthodontics, and complex prosthodontics to his employer's practice, tripling its production. Um, two of his uh, own practices for seven years, but found practice ownership too demanding. So he sold his practices and right after was diagnosed with cancer. After his recovery, he continued his career as an independent contractor and coaching his colleagues in their own offices to perform molar endos, implant dentistry, and surgical procedures. He started a dental advocacy and marketing group to elevate the status and prestige of dentistry within the medical profession, society, and media. Um, I could go on and on and on. His bio is 18 miles long, but um, my gosh, on Dentaltown, it just seems like whenever someone has... Some general question, like uh, I'm burned out, I'm fried, I'm tired of my staff. You always, you can always tell that you're approaching this from far, far away. Like, like, you know, like obviously you've done dentistry for three decades. Um, mm -hmm. what, was this your cancer journal? Was it being born in Hungary and coming to America? Where, where did you get such a profound compass where you can tell that you don't have these flippant light open? You're not like. The, the opinion of the day. You're like, no, mm. dude. Mm. The North Star's right here. Where does that come from? Um, I think it's basically, it's in my personality. I've always had this. I, I was always interested in anything from, from art to history, quantum mechanics, science, cosmology, society, relationships. I mean, you name it. I, I'm interested. Languages. I, I'm, I'm interested. Every, any, something that I don't know or I don't understand, it bugs the hell out of me, and I won't settle until I at least get a tiny concept of it. So that's what drives me even today, and uh, that is why you know I formed some of my own and certainly borrowed other people's opinion. Uh, and again, uh, I like to I like to basically take things apart and and look at components and and then hopefully put something together that, that that is relatable to people. So was cancer your rock bottom or not really? I mean, was that, were you looking death straight in the eyes and thinking this is it or did you? Uh... Well, uh, that, that, that was definitely, uh, I've been blessed with a lot of bottoms uh, in my life, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. Uh, I will tell you what, uh, I think my, my, my greatest depth was divorce. Uh, I divorced about 12 years ago with a nine, nine year old child. And, and that was such a, such a break for me because I always wanted to have a great family be which, because I, I didn't have a good one at home. I, I grew up in a very unhealthy family, unhealthy society, unhealthy educational system. So I really wanted to have a good family of my own. And unfortunately, after about 20 years, that did not work out. So that well, was 20 the, years. That's a long success. The average divorce, it comes after seven years. So, uh, okay. you, you've been, you, that, that's like being married three times of success. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll give that to you. Like, you know, that today they say, if you go out with a girl for a year, that's like millennial marriage. So yeah. Yeah. You know, so anyways, uh, so that was a, that was a big, big hit, but, uh, fortunately I recovered, uh, and it set me up on a path that, that has become something much more probably than I could have been without this tragedy, which is usually works out that way. So, uh, I was so, there. So you, you consider a marriage of 20 years, making mm -hmm. your daughter a tragedy. Mm -hmm. I mean, 20, 20 year marriage and you made a daughter. How the hell do you get tragedy out of that? Well, okay. We've got to give it to you. I mean, obviously, and again, now we are basically see more and more and more of the fruits of it. My daughter is a senior at Stanford, um, a free ride. Doesn't cost me a penny. 
She's going to be an environmental engineer. She's doing her master's for free. She gets paid for it, actually. So if anything... That also you know, sounds like she was born from a tragedy. That's... that's uh, <laughs> okay, so congratulations on being married yeah. 20 years and yeah. uh, and having this daughter. So then what was what was the uh, successful man fall down seven times, get up eight? So what what was your next tragedy or next, next tragedy was shortly came shortly after you know once i recovered from the from the disappointment of the divorce and everything uh, basically a month later when we signed the papers uh, a month later i was diagnosed with colon cancer and so that was uh, you can imagine uh, i mean all kinds of things go through your head Thank God I, I sold my practices about a year before that, so I didn't have much to lose in that uh, that uh, way. But, you know, I mean, it really means to you like, okay, I have I have no life. I, I, I'm i done. I'm finished. You even consider giving up and say, no, I don't want, I don't even want treatment. I just want to go. Uh, all kinds of things go through your head. But how, how old were you when you found out you had colon cancer? 48. 48, my God. And, and it's serious because... My oral surgeon, when I, I get out here in 87, mm -hmm. and I moved from Wichita, Kansas, the oral surgeon in Tempe, he was from Wichita, Kansas, and mm -hmm. every time we'd fly back for all the holidays, you know, mm -hmm. me, my spouse, four kids had one row in the back, his, you know, but anyway, he died of colon cancer yeah. at that age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was well, an oral surgeon. People, people are saying... You are supposed to get colonoscopy starting at at 50, even though bringing, they are thinking about bringing it down to 40 because there's so many younger people get, you know, get hit with colon cancer. So same, same thing with him. He died from it before mm -hmm. the age recommended to get screened for it. Right. He's right. already dead. Yeah. So I went through, you know, uh, 10 months of treatment, all radiation, chemo, and a major, major, major surgery. And so it took me 10 years to, 10 months to get to the end of the treatment and obviously a few more months to recover. And then uh, I went back to dentistry and, uh, but for another couple of years, I have to tell you that, uh, and I, this is one reason I haven't showed up on Dental Town so late because I was a member before, but I had all these things going on and, so I didn't get back to dental town for another two years because honestly, for that long, for another two years, I thought that I have no future. You know, you go back to recalls every six months and at any, any time you can get hit, oops, you know, your numbers are up or something showed up on the CT and you have now your stage four and that's it. So I, I, I was afraid to plan my future. I wasn't, I was, I was afraid to even make short term plans because again, that's how I saw it. And once I figured, I would say about a year or so ago, when I started seeing like, okay, well, maybe I'm gonna make it. Then I really started uh, kind of fr from where I left it at to educate myself, start dating again. You know, uh, I got a great job, uh, at a dream job, very, very unconventional, but great job for me. So this is when I got on Daniel Trown and I just kicked down the door with a 15 minute second molar endo. And uh, looks like uh, looks like people paid attention to me ever since. And I'm, and I'm incredibly honored and um, proud of that. So um, another great thing about you, you you've been in dentistry uh, three decades. Um, mm -hmm. When you see a bunch of dental offices Mm -hmm. in Southern California. I mean, that that's right. not, you know, that that's the happening place. Um, right. You get to see all these different experiments going on, whereas yes. everybody listening to you lives yeah. in one little dental office cage. And mm -hmm. so it just doesn't become a, a transparently obvious, uh, the mm -hmm. difference. Going around all these dental dental offices and an independent contractor, what, what do you think the keys to success? And success meaning I'm happy. I like yeah. dentistry and I'm yeah. making money and I'm having fun. Um, you know, what, 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 do, what do you think those key ingredients are? Well, I've been fortunate to get around, I would say dozens of dental offices, if not hundreds, because, you know, with my marketing and advocacy program, I visit personally, I visit a lot of dental offices. 
And so I've seen it all from large corporate to tiny one person dentist to you, you name it. And again, this is where my, my kind of broad outlook comes from because I've seen all kinds of practices, all kinds of personalities. And, um, you know, unfortunately what I see everywhere, which I also noticed on dental town is that dentists are not happy. They may be satisfied with the money, uh, but even that's getting kind of tough. But as far as their their professional, especially work work and life balance, is missing for a lot of people, and uh, and that's a big that's a big uh, issue for me because God knows I was there before. You know, I was working my butt off and I had no no time, no no capacity left to do anything for me or or maybe for my my family. So it is. It is very important to me to 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 try to figure it out for myself, and again, hopefully, passing it to others. So, work life balance is 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 no good. We are too much dentists and not enough people, not enough persons. Uh, usually, we tend to talk about dentistry, business, insurance, the trends in dentistry too much. And uh, and it's kind of it's kind of engulfing us, and then we are just basically a dentist and a little leftover of a person, father, husband, friend, this and that. That's where I that's what I see, and um, so I kind of created a system for myself where I hopefully try to find a, a better balance. Where like one step was I became very efficient at my work. I, I, I simply, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a great dentist, meaning like I'm not a crazy good, you know, specialist or this and that, but I, I simplified everything to the rock bottom. And that's what makes me very efficient. And that's why I believe efficiency is key because if, if you are running behind, everything is a drag, things are falling apart during the day, how can you have a great evening or a great weekend at the end? So I really pay attention to, to run my day smooth and efficiency, efficient anesthesia, efficient and fast endodontics, you know, quadrant uh, composite dentistry, implant placement, implant restoration, simplified. And um, for example, I have a great um, uh, uh, denture program, removal prosthodontics program, which I will later, I would like to add to your site as a, as a CE. I have 52 CE units, by the way. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certified to give away 52 C units by ADA. So later on, we can talk about this, but I would like to put these up on, on, on dental town. So once you are, once you are efficient during your day and you plan your evening, um, it's very important to me. My trick is I don't go home from work. I always go somewhere. Even if I have my girlfriend at this point, even if I have somebody, I always suggest let's go somewhere before we go home. Because I know once we go home, it's gonna be laundry, it's gonna be cooking, gonna be doing dishes. And then hopefully if something left, we have a little fun. But if we don't go home, we certainly have a meaningful evening somewhere, a dinner, we go to a plaza, we go to shopping, we go to a museum, a concert or something like that. And then we go home and then even if we fall asleep, we still had something at the end of the day that is meaningful to us, that balances out that, you know, hard days of work. So that's my trick. I, I don't go home after work. I go always, always go somewhere. So um, I want to go all the way back to um, when you say you think dentists aren't happy. Do you, yeah. do you think... Um, that's true compared to the rest of the population, or do you think it's uh, um, it would equal the population? Do, do you think they're more or less happy than any other sample size? I think I think dentists are are, are less happy, less satisfied than than uh, let's say comparable professions. And why? Where do you think that's coming from? Um, our work is stressful. Our work is very complex. We we work in a in a part of the body that is the most richly innervated, everything you do is hurting, scary, you know, causes anxiety. So we get that back from our patients 20, 30 times a day, right? So our work is hard. Um, new dentists come out with a major stress tensor, the, 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 the loan, the student loan, which sets them up on a path of anxiety because they have to pay that. 
And then we have this, again, work-life balance where, you know, we don't spend much time on us or on, on our loved ones. So that's kind of another tension because, you know, your kids, your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend wants wants to have you as, as a person. And then you go home and your head is still with that endo or, or bills or whatever. You can't even pay attention to that. And the third factor, I would say, besides efficiency, work-life balance is, um, is our the way dentistry and dentists are viewed in society, the media, and uh, within health professions. And let's, let's admit, even amongst us. Amongst us. So um, the thing is that what I do, what I started doing about a year ago, because I was tired of this. I was tired of he- hearing, I hate the dentist, I hate to be here, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's, that's not cool because I'm giving my heart to you. I'm giving my hardest knowledge, skills to you. I do world-class dentistry for you, and you still hate this. So we set up a system at my office where I'm uh, three days a week at, and basically what we do is we help our patients to express their appreciation to us, not just their grief and fear, you know. So we have a little system where uh, with a – few little products, we, we basically help them to express that, hey, this wasn't so bad, dentistry was not so bad, and and we, we show them that and make them aware of that and help them to express it to us and ha- express it to other people in the community. And that is that I love my dentist club about. So basically we let, we, we make people aware how wonderful treatment they get, that dentistry is not so bad after all, and, and again, at least give us some love, you know, for the hard work we do for you. Okay, so you're talking about your website, I love my dentist dot yes. club. I didn't even know dot club was a, uh, was a, um, uh, a domain name. And so it's Any, not. Anything can be now. Anything can be? Yeah, um, so I love my dentist dot club. Um, Mm -hmm. if they go to that site, it says, welcome to the, I love my dentist and I love my ortho club. So what is, um, learn more and order your free, your four free CE units. Um, Mm -hmm. so, so what are they going to find if they go to, I love my dentist.club? Well, they, they're going to find a little short paragraph of why this is important. Why, why we have to, uh, elevate our, our status and, and, um, our, our good name in, in with our patients amongst ourselves and society and, and media. So that's, that's what, that's what that is about. Because- which, which is, well, I want to back up first because it's your tagline on dental town. So on dental town, um, he goes by profitable GPs. Mm-hmm. Um, you can have your post, but he, in, his, in his signature says our ambitions are nothing less than elevating the status and respect of dentistry to the highest levels in the medical profession, society, and media. Join mm-hmm. our dental marketing and dental advocacy group, I Love um, My Dentist Talk Club. Mm-hmm. So, so where does that come from? Where, where, where does that mission come from? Okay, it, it basically a, a patient gave me this idea. I had a patient in the chair and she was very, you know, extrovert and outgoing and she says, Oh my gosh, you know, I love my dentist. And uh, my assistant says, well, that sounds like a bumper sticker. And we we were laughing because obviously it's it's just so absurd, right? I love my dentist. People say I love LA or I love my puppy or I love whatever, but I love Paris, you know, but who says I love my dentist? So it it kind of uh, made me think, I said, wow, maybe, maybe, maybe I should create something that is so absurd that actually people will, will pay attention to. And that's pretty much what I built the, the, whole, the whole system on. And so what I do now is I did it in my office, I tested it, and it worked great. I mean, the whole, the whole office has changed. My assistants are happier, the receptions are happier. We have a, we have a little banner in our, um, in our waiting room, this is not mine. This is one of my colleagues. If I may show it to you, mm-hmm. so you see that big banner on the bottom of the. Uh, I love the my banner? dentist. And those little stickers are little heart, you know, heart teeth, and the patients put their name on it. And at the end of the day, the receptionist puts it on this banner. So, like when my patient is leaving, and let's say they are happy and satisfied, my receptionist gives them a sticker to sign their name with the sharpie, and we put them on. In, in the waiting room. 
So when my next patient comes in and says, oh my gosh, like look at so many, so many people love this dentist, so he must be something. So that is one of the things we do. And then we give these magnets, everybody's laughing at Dental Town about this because they call me the magnet guy. So these are car magnets, which uh, you know people can buy, my clients can buy, and, and basically they give this away to patients and say, hey, put this on your car in a, in a parking lot. And um, it is great when you walk into your office in the morning and you have three, four cars with this on it, either patients and all of all of our employees have this by the way on their cars i have it on my car my girlfriend has it on on her car so these drives are these cars are driving around the city saying i love my dentist and our phone number and then figured after after i tested this and it's looking really good so i, I started telling this uh, about this to my friends you know other other uh, friend the dentist and and people I trained for clinical dentistry, and uh, many of them got in on it and bought a little package, and they are doing the same thing in their offices now and reporting back that it's working great because, again, we kind of we kind of face the patient and say, okay, you, you, you're behaving dentistry, but we are different. We, we, we will show you that dentistry is not as, as terrible as you think or as, as, uh, as it used to be. And so this is pretty much what we do. And, and how's that? Uh, how's that going? It's going great. I mean, you know how, how I can measure it. I don't care about numbers. That's another thing my colleagues always uh, always laugh about. I, I said I don't care about details, numbers, as long as my paycheck is good. So uh, I, I get paid by percentage, and I'm glad to report that ever since we started this program about a year ago. Uh, my check is up 30%. So the office is up 30% as well. Um, you know, some of the things that are most controversial is when um, you start talking about doing speed. I, I remember the most controversial thing Dental Town ever did is we had one of my buddies write an article on Dental Town Magazine called The 15 Minute Root Canal. Yes. And the orthodontist just went insane. Yeah. And, um, and they went insane because uh, it popped their bubble and they never read the article, and they never met the guy. Um, but it was mm. just amazing. Um, I went, mm. to, I went to his office. Uh, I would be doing a root canal, and mm. I didn't realize that half the time was uh, unlatching it, taking out the 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 deal, putting in the new one, putting. Mm. And he was had a stopwatch, and and he he had four slow speeds set up. Mm. So mm. I mean, he had two assistants. Uh, but anyway, he he did what all the endodontists did in an hour. But yes. he just did it in fifteen minutes or less, yes. and yes. and they um they they still can't comprehend that to this day. They they yes. just they just don't they don't see themselves. Um, when you what what is the dentistry um that you think like like you talk about the thirty minute molar endo, the mm -hmm. fifteen minute sinus tap, the five mm -hmm. minute denture bite registration. I mean mm -hmm. th these are things that'll just get you hung. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the small town rural America. So, yeah. so what, what rope would you like to, um, put around your neck first? The, uh, 30 minute molar endo or the 15 minute hey. sinus tap? Or the my, five? Are my, you ready to walk passion, the plank? <laughs> my passion is endo. Definitely. My passion is endo. And, uh, Howard, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm not blessed with like great equipment at, at where I'm at. Our is a Medicaid office, and especially we have a lot of uh, disabled people in our office through a, a county program, which pays pretty much a little bit, but they, they pay for everything. They pay for molar root canals. California Bay pays for molar root canals in Medicaid and, uh, and Medicare. And um, so I do a lot of root canals, but we get like 400 bucks for it, and I get 27% 20 of it. So... Fees are very low. So, again, I have to make it very efficient. And what what makes me very efficient in, in Ando, plus my assistants are mainly interns and, and fresh graduates out of the local uh, dental assisting program. So I can't say that I have, like, the best uh, assistant either, but they become the best eventually. And uh, and we are doing great. I have two, two newbies now, a few months with me, and they are doing 
excellent. I mean, I'm, I'm just blessed. They know everything that I need. And so we are doing great. So when it comes to endo, I, my technique is I just reduce the components, the steps to the bare minimum. I, I, I use five files, basically three hand files and two um, edge endo um, rotary files. And I use a very efficient uh, uh, irrigation and, and mainly a very, very good and very efficient obturation, which is the one step obturation, which is like a thermophile type uh, uh, obturation, except it's much more sophisticated. It's from Denmark. I, I order it straight from the factory because we use a ton of it. I, uh, and I, I, I pretty much recommend it to everyone. And those people who I'm trained, I train, I also uh, implement that in their practice because it literally takes one minute, 60 seconds to obturate any, any molar endo. No questions asked. So how do other dentists um, that you've trained with your online videos and programs, um, mm -hmm. how is it going with this? It's going well. I, I sent out my endo program to about 300 dentists already. Uh, mainly, I think, young guys. Uh, a few of them already visited me. They, they shadowed me. They hung up with me at my office or at, my, at the other office I, I train at. And... Um, you know, I get things like, man, like my first thing came came out like half, 50% less time. So deficiency is, still, is there definitely because again, everything is everything is uh, fewer steps, fewer components, and, and everything is super efficient. So I'm getting incredible feedbacks uh, for most people who get back to me. And I actually, I, I bug my, my, my colleagues about it. I send them emails, hey, how's it going? You know, don't don't check out, you know, send me x-rays so I can critique your work, send me pre or post-op x-rays. Unfortunately, not too many people take advantage of that. I would, I said, I have all the time I need, send me stuff, ask questions, so so we can we can get better uh, at this. Um, when I talk to um, dental office consultants or um, dental transition people, Mm -hmm. um, they, they always say the same thing that the the um, the healthy business of dentistry in America mm -hmm. today is a um, doing bread and butter dentistry. Um, yeah. Seven root canals. Um, if the office doesn't have seven root canals a month, mm -hmm. it, it, it's 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 dying. Um, yeah. Extractions and oral surgeries the most. Um, mm -hmm. Basic crown and bridge fillings. But when yes. you talk to dentists, the um, the, 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 right out of the gate, half of them say, oh, I hate molar endo. I, I don't do extractions. Mm -hmm. I don't. And they want to go into, like, sleep medicine, Invisalign, yeah. cosmetic dentistry. Um, and what, what would you say to the young, you know, the quarter of our viewers that are still in dental school, the rest yeah. under 30, who are starting to have visions of the lollipops in their head of just doing bleaching and Invisalign uh, when – or you, you're in Southern California. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most – profitable real world dental offices on the ground what kind of what kind of dentistry are they doing to make a business today you you may have heard johnson family dentistry in santa barbara i don't know johnson steve johnson he he, he created like a small chain about six offices uh bread and butter dentistry what, what's I, his name steve johnson's what steve johnson uh and he runs uh, johnson family dentistry okay Amazing guy, amazing guy. Uh, they are in in southern Santa Barbara and uh, and the surrounding towns now. That's where I started my career. That's where I I worked for fifteen years and associate. So basically, when when I started there as a dental assistant and later as a dentist, uh, eventually there's three things we did. That that office uh, was doing great already on that level. I don't want to say numbers because that's not my business, but basically there's three things that we introduced, actually four. One, immediately we dedicated a financial coordinator because their production was above a million at that time, back in the 80s. So we introduced a financial coordinator, a nicely dressed lady who was just doing payment arrangements, this and that. And that just skyrocketed everything because previously either I did the selling or my assistant did the selling while trying to set up the next chair. 
So that was amazing. So I recommend to people who have larger offices, I would say around a million, dedicate someone as a financial coordinator. And she just does that. Have a little private office for her, uh, civilian clothing, and have her take care of the, the finances of your, of your treatment plans. And the other thing that we did is was clinical, basically. I, I, I went to the owner and I said, listen, I want to do implants. I want to do ortho. I want to do surgery. I want to do, I want to do complex prosthodontics. I'll do the education. You provide the material. And again, smart guy, he, he went for it. And so we basically introduced everything there. And of course, obviously that, that went, went through the roof as well. So I would say we probably made at the end when I when I left we made about six times of, of production when then we begin. Not all my not all my doing. I'm, I'm I don't I don't want to say that because again that person is amazing. But guess what? Our main money it was still coming from molar root canals, buildups and preps at the same time at the same appointment, dentures. Fillings, you know, quadrant dentistry fillings, all that stuff. And later we introduced this specialty stuff, but it was hard then, but it's, it's much easier today. It's much easier today to do that. And again, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying to young dentists, if you think today that you're going to make a good living, let's say above $200,000 from filling, amalgam fillings or fillings and occasional crowns and profies and little cleaning, little this, it's not going to happen. And even if it will happen, you're going to hate it. You know, what, what makes interesting, uh, dentistry interesting is, is the challenge, you know, that you do some amazing stuff. I mean, I've done thousands of root canals in my life. I still get the jitters when I look at a nice work that I get today. Or same thing, a, a filling, a, a composite filling I do. I stop at the end of the procedure and I show it to my assistant. I said, look at this. Look what we have done here in a half an hour. And, and the girls just smile and say, yeah, that, that's nice. I say, yeah, it's, it is nice. So that's I kind of give myself a feedback that, that what we do is important, what we do is great, and in front of the patient, I make them aware of that. So pretty much that's, and again, we got into ortho. I did braces for many years. Later on, uh, it became just too complicated. Ortho is very difficult to fit into a general practice, by the way unless you have so many patients that you can dedicate an entire day or at least a half a day just for ortho, it's tough to do it in, in, in GP practice. Uh, the Invisalign, I do nothing but Invisalign now. Um, again, braces are great, but for a GP, I think in, Invisalign is kind of uh, a breeze compared to braces. So you like Invisalign, mm -hmm. but you don't do the hardwire braces. I used to do it for seven years, but then but you don't but do it I, anymore. Kind of, I kind of gave up on that because what I learned and the offices I, I was working at, obviously it was much easier to just do Invisalign and the things we can do, obviously we refer out. Yeah, I, I always thought it was um, good to do uh, for burnout. Um, I You know, ev mm -hmm. everybody um, that mm -hmm. I um, know, they, they, they always say to keep, you know, it's a repetitive thing you're doing all day long. So you yeah. got to add a specialty every five years. I've had yeah. so many people on this show tell me that what um, saved them intellectually from burnout was yeah. even though TMJ and, and um, um, Dawson might have only been 1% mm -hmm. of their revenue, but spending five years learning all that kept them going. And then they went and did, you know, Brock Rondo or Richard mm -hmm. Litt Ortho. They did that for five or six years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to, to just sit there and do mm -hmm. quadrant MOD composites yeah. all day long, I mean, you just, um, it just, it's not good for a smart person. Um yes. But, 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 but you think, um, um, so if they were in school, you would say what skills they have to learn. You'd say molar endo mm -hmm. and Invisalign. Yes. Um, what, uh, what about class implants? Two, class two composites. Class two composites. It, that's a big, that's a big producer for me. Uh, I do about 20, 30, 40 large composites in my office a day. Uh, obviously I have to be super, super efficient with that and good with that. So, so what's your technique? How, how do you do, how many composites do you do a day? About 20, 30, 40. 
And how and is, is there how many at a time? You usually do quadrant uh, or quadrant quadrant and it's at least four, sometimes five, six fillings, yes. On one patient? Yes. And how long would that appointment be? About thirty minutes. Holy moly. <laughs> That's crazy. And you have this I, on online courses? Uh, well, I don't have a video of it, but people ask me to do it, so probably I'll get it done. But, I, uh, Howard, I didn't believe it either. But, you know, people were bugging me, and I'm like, oh, I told my sister, okay, me okay, m measure the time. So we start, and I started with cavity preparation, not anesthesia, but cavity preparation, right? So we did it. We did four MODs. I have it online. I have the picture up. The X-ray up. Uh, we did four MOD fillings in one quadrant in 25 minutes, and I did it so that I know I'm going to pose this. So you you can imagine that I paid attention. So, uh, but again, I'm not a great dentist. I just I just simplify the the tools, the steps, the the everything about it, and that's what makes it. That's what makes it. Is this it, on a thread right now on Dental Town? Uh. I don't know if it's a thread on its own, but I, I posted this uh, regarding to well, regarding to something relating to something. Was it on the another sectional matrix thread, or do you remember? That, 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 yeah, it's sectional matrix, bad, and then people, some somebody posted that you know they always have difficulty with class two. Again, by the way, I sent this technique out to probably a uh, hundred people because see. When you see, I, I follow advertising, what what owners and and corporations advertise them for? Do they want a dentist, ninety percent of the time, proficient in molar endo is there, ninety percent of the time. You know this. You know that how 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 much people who hire want to have someone who does endo uh, molar endo. So what I'm telling a young dentist, number one thing, after graduation, learn endo molar endo and you're gonna be the top 10 percent as far as getting a chance at a great job that that in itself will increase your chances by 90 percent over the others molar endo second class two composites because obviously it's very it's done every, everywhere again it's very time consuming the way it's taught and and there's a lot of work that a lot of amalgams need to be replaced by now and the corporations have a ton of uh, class two uh, composites. So that's the second one, second procedure you have to get in. Molar endo and class two. And uh, for those who, for those, this is for new graduates because implant is a little bit further out the way. Maybe ortho is a little further out the way, but, but these are the things that a young graduate has to get into. Molar endo and good good uh, class two, maybe maybe prosthodontics, removable prosthodontics. That's another big okay, thing. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the, okay, so you you can do four, so if you, if someone needs four MOD composites in a quadrant, mm -hmm. you'll only schedule, mm -hmm. you only need a half hour. Right, Okay. No, Did, no, no, they schedule me an hour, but I take 30 minutes. Is, is the patient in the room an hour? I mean, uh, no, not necessarily, but, not necessarily. but I mean, is, you know, like setting up the room, seating the yeah. patient, getting all ready. So you're just talking about doctor time. Correct. Oh, you right. know, the, the way, the way we are with, with Medicaid, Medicare, and with this regional program, we have to do such a thorough admin, uh, administration and x-rays and, and, and photographs and, and narratives that a lot of times half of that one hour is going to go to x-rays, right. photographs, this, that, you know, I'd, I'd have to tell my manager what to put down in order to get get uh, 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 accepted, right? So they're, they're so, so demanding in their x-rays that I that's why I, if I schedule an hour, doctor's time is 30 minutes, the rest is x-rays, follow up, this and that, because that's that takes up half of our time. Okay, so that, that makes a lot of sense to me, the doc time. And, and folks, what he just said so clearly is why Southwest Airlines is the number one um, leader in America. Um, they keep their planes in the sky 12 hours a day and United mm -hmm. and American only um, eight hours a day. Yeah. And the difference four hours means they have a 50% lower cost structure. And every time I ever, like like over Christmas, I mean, mm -hmm. 
Um, when I visit mom in Kansas and I, my mm-hmm. the grandkids in Texas, I'm always walk. I walk into any dental office I see. I I made my daughter in law almost wreck the car. I said, "Stop, stop, stop!" There's a dental office. I don't want to <laughs> go to. I don't want to go to that stupid mall for an hour. Just drop me off. <laughs> and every dental office you've ever walked in your life, the doctor's back in the private office waiting for a damn room. It's like yeah. uh, so the doctor gets thirty five percent, staff gets twenty twenty five percent, lab ten, supplies six, mm-hmm. and what is this guy? doing waiting for a chair um they just uh and then when you say to them they'll say what's your overhead and they'll tell you over and i'll say well what percent of the 168 hours in a week last week were mm-hmm. your operatories being used had a human in there and and, and you're, you're talking about nobody in the industry uses their chairs 15 18 percent and then, right. and then they say they want to build uh, another office because uh they want to bring in an associate and it's like mm-hmm. Dude, your 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 office isn't used eighty percent of the hours in a week. So any so anyway, so you so all the money people understand that the cost is labor and how and productivity. Yeah. What can your labor produce an hour a time? It, yeah. It's not the electric bill or how much your supplies cost. So um, b- back to that thirty minute. Um, back to your composites though. Um, mm-hmm. Do you use a rubber brett band? What type of composite is it? Bulk here? Can you in, any more details of the uh, the composite? Okay, uh, I have to admit for composites, I don't use rubber dam. Okay. Uh, I I did not use rubber dam for endo either. But when I started this endo thread. All the bugging and this and that. Now I get into rubber dam with endos much more. Okay, but when you say you didn't use rubber dam, did you l- use something else that was an isolate? Well, was the it conven- a- your conventional? The conventional uh, isolation, basically okay. bread and butter, cotton roll suction, just pay, paying a, paying it. I was I wasn't trained in Europe for rubber dam, so again, it's not an excuse, absolutely not an excuse. But as far as this office. The time we have, the, the the equipment we have, and everything. Sadly, it, it would be just very difficult to to fit that in there. And again, I came up with a with a system that works great for me. So no no rubber dam for my for my uh, for my uh, composites. Uh, one great thing that I have as far as doing a great work besides usual isolation is every every single. Treatment, I have a syringe with uh, ferric sulfide, the uh, astringidin, with a brush tip. So anytime I have a little hemorrhage, whether it's a crown prep, uh, endo, pulpotomy, class two composite, any, any, anything, I basically stop the, the hemorrhage or the bleeding right away. Then I place my matrix. And you are getting to like, how do I do four MODs in such a short time? Basically, I set up my sectional matrix bands, all of them at the same time. Uh, I pre-bend them, set them up, secure them with the with the with the anatomical wedge. I don't use rings, by the way. I just use uh, cotton pliers to to uh, contour my matrices until I'm happy with all eight of them, let's say. And then then I. I don't do a uh, total edge technique anymore for about 10 years now. I use a self edge, whether prime primer and bond, but usually one step now. And then obviously, by the way, we use decay indicator with everything, cramp preps, endo cavities, then the, the decay indicator. I love it. it. It gives me a peace of mind. So we do the one step bond and then uh, obviously flow ball composite. My biggest trick with composites because that's what I see everywhere, and unfortunately, are, it's being advertised to us, is just fill up the cavity. Now we have this block fill thing, this flowable block fill. Just fill up the cavity, cure it, and then chisel the rest of it away. Well, that's going to take up probably a third of your appointment. So my trick is I make my anatomy, my occlusal anatomy, as close to the final as possible before I cure it. So the primary anatomy is there at least, the, the terminal uh, uh, edges are there, um, everything immaculate, and then that's when I cure it. So my finishing time is literally 10 seconds a tooth because I barely have any any leftover, any any flash. So that's what that's what makes makes my composites really super fast is that I have very little finish very little finish to do at the end. So when back back to this unhappiness thing. Um, mm-hmm. It seems like in, uh, there, there's always something. When I got out of school in 87, we both got out about the same time. Um, yeah. 
it was capitation. And, yes. you know, it's always something. And now yeah. it's corporate dentistry. Yes. And what do, you, what do you see in California that, that impact? Um, what, 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 what does it mean to you? I mean, um, is it going to ruin yeah. dentistry? Is it going to get bigger? Um, what, what, is, what does it mean to you? Obviously, it's a slow process. It's much faster than I thought. I did not believe that corporate dentistry will take a, such a big part in dentistry by the time I finish working. It's, it's happening much faster. Obviously, it's all over the place. Um, you know, small offices are still around. Uh, you know, like old established offices are still around. Uh, I started two small offices two part-time offices back like in 2005-ish. And I did okay. You know, I, I tripled the practice in a short time because, again, I introduced uh, I introduced new procedures to it. I bought a pedo practice and I opened it up to families. So all uh, parents, aunts, and uncles started coming. So that just like was a great boost. But what I'm telling young people today and pretty much anybody that at least in an area like this, like like – cosmopolitan area. If you want to start a practice from scratch or from very, very small, it's a suicide. Forget about it. If you ever consider buying your own office, running your own office, you at least have to buy an office that produces about a, a million dollars to have a chance. Uh, but small office is, is basically... I, I, I hate to say this, but really don't have a chance, do, definitely don't have, doesn't have a future. So young people have to face, have to realize that they are going to have to deal with corporate dentistry one way or another. Whether they create a corporation, like my friend Steven Johnson did, he has, again, six, eight offices now, starting basically from one, or you're going to work for a corporation in one way or another. So make peace with that. Is it sad? Well, you can argue about that, but is it the future? Definitely. Now, how do you ride this corporate wave? Same thing. You become efficient. You become efficient at endo, composites, implants. You, you learn some specialty. You go to a corporate office and you can make your little $1,500, $2,000 a day and basically no headaches. It's not a bad way to live, not a bad way to practice when you make your little 1500 every. My goal is $1,500 average pretty much anywhere I go. So that's, that's. How much, what, what's your, what's your daily average? As far as, as far as production? No, no. What, what, what is your, what is your daily pay? I mean, do you do a minimum 1500. pay? 1500. 1500. Yes. Um, as an independent contractor. Yes. Gross. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's huge money. Well, when I when I when I train or when I contract, I well, there are days when I I make three four thousand as a contractor, and I only get twenty seven percent. Oh, that that's not your net twenty seven percent. That that's your gross production. So so uh, the three four thousand that I make in these more high tech offices, that's my take home money a day. Three four thousand. Three or four thousand would be your your what 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 percent or what what is the terms? Are you I get 27%. So the 27% is three, 4,000. So my production is obviously 12,000 or so. And is there uh so your, is that the going rate or is that what you can command is 27% is of uh mm -hmm. collect, is it production or adjusted production, production collection? Produ production. Mm -hmm. So is that the norm in California that they'll pay you 27% in production? Um, uh, I think it could be higher because those those places I do implants, sinus lifts, I do surgical extractions, bone grafting, molar endo. So these are basically specialty things, little ortho. Uh, I think I could get a little bit more than that, but uh, they reimbursed me for my uh, material. Like there was a discussion like, okay, what should be your percentage? And uh, so my my the way I do it, I get 27% of production, but... They pay, they pay me for the implant I bring. They pay me for the components. They pay the lab fee. So this way, you know, net, as far as my net compensation, I'm, I'm happy with 27%. Again, many times I make three, four grand a day in those offices and God bless them. Uh, that is, that is fine with me. Yeah. Um, 
So the, when they pay you 27%, do they pay 100% of lab bill, any benefits, yeah. any malpractice, anything like that? Or do no, that's, 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 that's on me. I'm, I'm a corporation, so that's all on me. Okay. The lab, they pay only the lab fee, and they provide everything, assistance, disposables, all the basic stuff. And you live, um, you live in a boat with your girlfriend in the harbor. <laughs> Did you still do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you post pictures and you can see yourself on a deck. So so talk about that. You're where where do where do you live? Okay, so the the marina in Los Angeles called it's near Santa Monica or Venice Beach, best place in town. It's called Marina del Rey. Right. It's a it's a big it's a big bay, fifty five hundred boats all around. And, um, well, it's a, it's an old dream of mine, even though I came from a landlocked country to, uh, be close to water. I mean, to me, ocean is mesmerizing. Uh, the beach is mesmerizing because I, I grew up in a, again, a landlocked country, you know, cold winters and all. So palm trees, e even today, they, 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 uh, give me one, such a wonderful happiness. And um, I always wanted a boat. I didn't know anything about boats, but I would say about four years ago, I found out that it's not very expensive to keep a boat in a marina. Uh, it was actually at that time about $400 a month. So I started learning boats. I decided I'm gonna get a sailboat instead of a motorboat. I bought a boat in San Diego. I had it brought up and I anchored it and I learned sailing. And uh, I don't live there like permanently, but we, my girlfriend at, at this point, she is living there because she works there all the time. But I spend about, I would say three nights, four nights a week down there. Wow. Now you went to dental school in Hungary, right? That's correct. Um, that was in um, the second largest university in Hungary. Um, um, what, what do you think is the different, the most major difference um, between uh, being a dentist in Hungary and the United States? There's a lot of people who um, mm -hmm. will never get the advantage of seeing all these countries. I, I still think that's the greatest yeah. gift I ever received was seeing all these countries. What, what, what do you think that how the dentists in Hungary and the United States uh, don't know about each other? Okay. Um, even though it's a little different now, but our dental school was five years because we don't have colleges. From from high school, high school is incredibly difficult in Europe. It's 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 insane. If you want to get into a good school, law school, med school, dental school, you have to be just perfect, and you have a very difficult entrance exam. But if you get in, you start dental school at eighteen, and then you go through general education, biology, chemistry, this and that. In third year, you start doing some dentistry and you, you graduate after five, uh, five years. Uh, very strict, 40% of, of the student had to repeat an entire year at least, so they just kick you back if you failed an exam. So it takes you an extra year or extra two years. There was no tuition, it didn't cost a cent. That was a good part, very strict. We got great academics, but the dentist we were taught at the time was about 50 years behind the US. So I, when I left, Hungary in 1988, my dentistry was about half a century behind the developed world. You can imagine that. We had no porcelain crowns, barely any endo. It was just metal crowns with like a plastic facing and stuff like that. Now, that's education. Dentistry is basically a socialized dentistry. Uh, basically, the government uh, basic it used to the government used to own all the offices during communism, but then during the changes in the 90s, they gave it to the dentists, and they in order to, for dentists to take care of their districts, right? So you have a, you are a dentist, you got a dental office with uh, 2,000 people, and the state gives you a cap check for those people to take care, right? Like mm -hmm. like. It's almost like a state-run uh, HMO, basically. And then, unfortunately, well, now whether you do a good job or not, they don't care. You get your money, and the less you do, the more you save. So even though dentistry has really um, developed, especially in the cities, like Budapest has basically world-class dentistry now and technology, but in a countryside, dentistry is still quite behind, and... Uh, and unfortunately, it was very prominent during communism. Today's patients still pay under the table to the dentist, expecting better materials, better treatment. 
And unfortunately, that's also so in medicine. So if you have an operation, you have a tumor, you have a you have a appendicitis, you're gonna give cash to the doctor to treat you better. And what year did you graduate from uh, University of uh, Drebikin School of Dentistry? I'm sorry. What what year did you graduate? Eighty eight. Eighty eight. Right, right before the end of communism. Yeah. Um. And they they're um. Did, are you ever tempted? Were you ever tempted to go back to Hungary? Um. Your roots no. where you're from. No. no and and why, why, why do you think it's been in a decline, a population decline ever since the Berlin Wall fell down and it still just continues to slide? Where, what, why, and, and, and they can't attract a, a great mind like yours that was born there. So they lost you. I, yeah. I, I always think it's amazing when people are against immigration. Mm-hmm. It's like, are you out of your mind? They just left their team and want to join your team. You should meet them. they're proud of it. And yeah, you should meet them with a dozen roses. You, you know, you the not funny John. part that they're proud of it. They're proud that, oh, this Hungarian now works in the U.S. They're proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> in, in Hungary, they're proud of it? But, yeah. but but why why do they lose you to immigration and why are they still declining and why um why okay um obviously it's, it's a com- obviously it's a complex problem Hungary is about ten million people as you said slowly declining but when Hungary became part of the part of the European Union the borders opened up in the hope of better life about 10% of the population left. So 800,000 people left Hungary over the years. And of course, the best ones, the most ambitious ones uh, left Hungary. And uh, unfortunately, it shows on the economy. I mean, imagine like all the good doctors, all the good teachers, all the good mechanics, uh, painters, artists, uh, economists leave the country and, uh, and, Sadly, the the effect of the European Union membership was also that the union basically deteriorated or or destroyed the local production. So the the, the factories were closed. The the we had in agriculture we had these community farms in every village. They closed, so people lost their jobs. And there's basically there's no production in Hungary. Little assembly work, and people just basically do this and that. So. No, no, no major production, definitely almost nothing to export. And again, people just leave because there's in a way nothing to do, nothing to grow. So therefore about 10% of Hungary's population left within a few years. That, and, and the other thing, uh, geography, I mean, uh, God, mm-hmm. when you look at history, I mean, mm-hmm. when, when you're landlocked between monster companies <laughs> of Poland, Ukraine, Romania, Germany, Russia, Prussia. I mean, yeah. my gosh. I mean, the um, United States is such a little bumpkin country on the other side of the world. It's got an ocean on each side. I mean, it's so uh, yeah. it's so isolated. And then Hungary all through history. I mean, it's like yeah. it's like you it's like the country was born in the middle of a four lane intersection. Yeah. I mean, but, yeah. but we have this one thing in common. We have a great mixture of genetics that is very beneficial for, for creativity and um, smarts, right? Huh. I, uh, yeah, I just, so America, much. America, with all the immigrants, have this great ver- ver- versatility, right, from all over the world. Hunger didn't go anywhere, but certainly these big empires you, you were talking about certainly went through Hungary, so we have a great genetic makeup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean of all the different peoples coming through? Yeah, yeah. The, I remember. I remember. Um, the first time I went to Japan, the most shocking thing was like, okay, why is this the most everybody. challenged English speaking country? And I mean, yeah. this is the most isolated I, I've seen. Yeah. And this Japanese. That, that's why I love when Japanese when when the mm-hmm. dentists bring in. You know, you you have someone that's that can um tell you everything, and he's like, dude, he goes um. They're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Their largest city faces the Pacific, which yeah. covers half the globe. He goes, do you realize that Genghis Khan didn't even come through here? Marco yeah. Polo didn't come through here. He goes, nobody came here for 10,000 years. Yeah. And it's just a just amazing, uh, all that. Um, yeah. On Dentaltown, what, what do you think... Um, um, do you think there's a difference between um, what do you think the challenges are of the young versus the old on Dental Town? I mean, you have a lot of young uh, millennials and a lot of old boomers. Um, what, what, what is your sense on Dental Town? 
Um, there's some commonalities. I think young young dentists are are scared or concerned. Obviously, a lot of old dentists are concerned because again, they don't see much growth. They they see you know corporate dentists taking over maybe in their area. Maybe they simply burned out. Uh, they are they're obviously concerned about retirement. So they have a commonalities. I think I think. Maybe maybe the middle segment, like the 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 the, the middle age segment, who is still growing, who is still uh, optimistic, who is still ambitious, are doing better. But the either end, the young or the pre-retiree group, I think they have uh, they have concerns, and uh, I think these have to be addressed. Uh, maybe certain certain way, a similar way, maybe different ways, but. Um, but uh, with the older generation, it's very difficult to convince somebody that, hey, you should still, you know, you could still pick this up. You could still become passionate about this, either work or your life in general. And that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm attempting to do, because I'm doing it myself. I preach what I do. And uh, I hope somebody gets inspired. If one person gets in inspired by it, I, I already done my job. So all in all, when retirement comes, guess what? You're still going to have to live. You're still going to have to create a good life for yourself. Probably going to be harder because now you don't have this structure of your work. So now you have to start over. And then, so what are you going to do for another 20, 30 years after you retire? So I always tell people, prepare for your retirement, basically not just financially, but start creating yourself a life, a social life, or whatever, hobbies, sports, hunting, whatever you are into, start preparing for retirement right now. I know exactly how I'm going to retire. I know exactly how it's going to look like right now. And uh, because why? Because I'm, I, I already experienced so many things. I tried so many things. I know what's good for me. So I um, when I retire, I, I try to retire in about five years. I'm going to be 60 in five years. So... When I retire, I know exactly where I'm going to live, how I'm going to live. I don't know how much money I'm going to have, but that's kind of, we will see. But I, I certainly will know how what it's going to look like. And that's what I that suggest to, to, the, to the elderly colleagues, is, is prepare for retirement, not just financially, but as far as lifestyle, and, and, and make the rest of your life, the, the, the fruits of your work, make it, make it great because that's when you're supposed to enjoy it the most when you don't have all these headaches. So if the person is listening to you right now and he says, look, dude, I'm burned out. I'm fried. Mm -hmm. I hate dentistry. I mean, you see that thread on dentistry. I hate dentistry with every fiber of my body. <laughs> what would you tell that guy? Uh, don't touch that for now. Don't touch dentistry. You've been running your office, good or bad, for so long. It's very difficult to change your office right now. Leave that alone for now and start building a great personal life. After work, in the evenings, on the weekend, on vacations. Basically, tune up your, your, your personal life. As, as, as far as getting excited and get a different point of view. You know, when you are in the office and you are 90% dentist, how can you think for yourself as far as like what you like to do, what gets you excited, what kind of people you get a, a, a along? So leave your dentistry for a little bit and just start building a great personal life during the week and on the weekends. Every single day, pay attention to that. Invest, invest as much into your personal life, like you invested into your professional life early on. That's my number one advice. Yeah, and I like how you're always saying that, um, you know, when you go, um, when you're done with a really stressful day, mm -hmm. uh, you're tired, so you go home, mm -hmm. and what do you do? You sit on the couch and watch TV or whatever, mm -hmm. and you you recommend that you go out to eat, that you go to a mm -hmm. museum, that you, you go do something and mm -hmm. catch your second wind. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I also see so many uh, dentists that will tell you that, you know, um, they reached everything they dreamed of when they were a child. Yet, if they would have reached that as a child, they would have bought boats and jet skis, and they, they they'd have been busy playing with all this stuff. And now mm -hmm. they have all that money, and they're not playing. Uh, so something's wrong. They're they're, they're not exactly. happy. It's no longer exactly. fun. Um, exactly. Is there anything you want to talk about that uh, you thought we were talking about and we didn't? Um, let's talk about quantum physics. Oh, Niels Bohr. <laughs> I love Niels Bohr. Uh, so all in all, 
a year ago, I got into physics. I was very, very pissed that I don't understand physics. So I got into it. Somebody took me to magnets. And again, people don't believe me, but I am the one person in the world, in the entire world, who knows how magnets work, how they attract and repel each other. I, I know how the, the right magnetic field is and a bunch of other things. So that's my passion. My current passion now is quantum physics, field theory, cosmology, gravity, and things like that. That's what I'm into. And I, I wrote already six articles that I'm trying to publish. As you can imagine, it's not easy because I'm an outsider and it's difficult for anyone. But still, and I have another tw 20 articles that I'm working on recently. And how do you think uh, magnets work? Uh, the model of the magnetic field that, that we know today around a magnet is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. So I took, I took the time and I, 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 dis I discovered that the, the geometry of a magnetic field around, an imp around a magnet is, is totally different. Basically, imagine a magnet in the center and you have two donuts, one on top, one on the bottom, right? The donuts are the actual magnetic fields. And the magnetic field comes out on the equator and goes back on the top as a vortex, like a literal vortex, like a tornado, and back on the bottom. And basically, when you put two magnets together, if these tornadoes enhance each other, they attract. If they decrease each other's power, then they repel each other. So fundamentally, this is, mag this is magnets. Well, that's another thing I love about dentists is um, they're always in the top 1% of years of education in any society you go to, and they're always in the top 3 to 5% in uh, income. Yep. And so every country I've ever been to, I have some homie who's a doctor who's born and raised there showing me every little detail of just the little nuances that, um, and it's funny how, yeah, the dentistry is different, but so is just like, the sink or the toilet or yeah. how they made, you know, a sauce or a bread mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, I, I just love dentist. Um, mm -hmm. And my boys know it too. They're just, um, I mean, over Christmas, uh, we saw so many dentists and mm -hmm. they always say the same thing. They go, damn, dentists are just smart, man. They read so much. I mean, here you are, you got eight, you're a dentist and you're reading Niels Bohr. But uh, mm -hmm. other than that, uh, hey, man, I'm a huge fan of your post. Uh, love reading your stuff. Thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. And it was just an honor to podcast you today. It's my honor. I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised that you noticed me at all or other people, but I'm very, very grateful for that because I'm having a ton of fun on Daniel town. Um, again, I hope we can work together on the, on the issues we talked about. I would love to elevate the dentistry to, to its proper place. That would make us happy and dentist itself. And again, I'd like to see uh, almost similar to the, to the pink ribbon movement for breast cancer. I would like to see this. I love my dentist everywhere in the, in the country. And I encourage people who are into this, who, who, who look at this as a, as a common goal that instead of being hated or feared, I hope that especially with young people, we can turn this around and we can make people love dentistry and therefore we can love it more ourselves. And, and it's really profound if you think about it because um, I can't say to uh, a fat person, hey fatty, shut up. Yeah. But they can walk into my office and say, I hate going to the dentist. Correct, correct. And I'm like, well, if you go out there and you say, I hate you know, people from yeah. Australia or, or whatever, I mean, yeah. it's open hatred on dentistry. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and it's not just the insult of it, it's the fact that I learned very, very early, because um, I'd watch my, the older dentist, and I used to remember this one, he'd go in there and he'd give a shot, and then when he came out, he would he would take such a deep breath yeah. that I realized he, he didn't breathe through the whole shot. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and he would just, and, and I thought, oh, God. So when I started, um, trying to breathe mm -hmm. and then when I would start noticing that I was feeling something was wrong I was feeling stressed or agitated or whatever mm -hmm. I realized 
we don't know what's going on, but it's coming from this this animal Absolutely. right here. This ain't, it, it ain't it, coming from... He absorbed it. Yeah, and, and so I knew, talk about magnetism. I mean, you know there's magnetism and, and all these mm-hmm. things like that, but mm-hmm. if you say, I believe in ESP, they think you're crazy. But I can tell you, when this human is laying next to you, stressed out, it's affecting me. And Absolutely. dentists have feelings, too. I'm doing a filling mm-hmm. on you, but I got feelings, too. Yeah. And if you just walk in there and start saying, I hate you, I hate going to the dentist, how come, how come, you know, Obama doesn't pay for this or my boss? It's like, you know, shut up, you know. Uh, you know, um, Obama didn't make you eat Dr. Pepper and chocolate. And yeah. why the hell, if your employer's got to pay, I mean, when they say healthcare is a human right, I'm pretty sure it should first be oxygen, then water, then food. I'm pretty sure healthcare would be at the very end of that train. And especially and then, since and then one, be at the end of that. <laughs> you know, especially since one out of three earthlings never die of a disease. They die in an accident, you know, um, um, murder, suicide, you know, car wrecks, collisions. So one in three will never even get a deadly disease. They, they're dead before that. But I do think that people need to realize that um, the time for open season on dentistry where you can just go in there and say, you hate everything, you don't want to pay, you, you want your teeth to fix up perfectly, but the rest of you looks like crap. You yeah. know, when, when they say, you know, well, why is this tooth broke? I'm, I always want to say, have you seen a mirror? You look like you <laughs> fell out of a car and are dead. I mean, how old are you? And they're like, 68. And it's like, well, how can you be 68 and wondering why your tooth broke? I mean, you look like there's nothing working left on you. And, and not only are you shocked it broke, but you want someone else to pay for it. Yeah. And so I love this. Uh, it's just kind of like standing up for us. I was like, you know, love your dentist, man. It's a tough job. Yeah. Uh, when all you got is a bunch of people who, uh, like I say, mo- when, when they say half of America sees a dentist every year, uh, yeah, they see the dentist every year at Taco Bell or the grocery mm-hmm. store or on the <laughs> beach, but it's not nice. in a dental office. But Laz, uh, thank you so much for all you do. It was great seeing you today. My pleasure. All right, buddy. Have a great day.